speaking on behalf of the province today are Dr. Jennifer Russell, the province's Chief Medical Officer of Health, and the Honorable Blaine Higgs, Premier of New Brunswick. Les porte-parole aujourd'hui sont le médecin hygiéniste en chef, le Dr. Jennifer Russell, et l'honorable Blaine Higgs, Premier ministre de Nouveau-Brunswick. Dr. Russell. Thank you, Bruce. Merci, Bruce. Bon après-midi à tous et à toutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Since our last briefing, another New Brunswicker has died as a result of COVID-19. This was an individual aged 60 to 69 residing in Zone 2, which is the St. John region. We have now experienced 34 deaths from the virus since the pandemic began last year. While our losses have been relatively few compared to some other jurisdictions, we are collectively diminished by each life loss due to COVID-19. Chacune de ces 34 personnes avait une vie, une famille et des êtres chers qui les aimaient. Leur mort a laissé un trou béant dans leur vie, tout comme dans, notre, dans, dans la nôtre d'ailleurs. Nous vivons dans une petite province et il existe des liens entre nous tous. Lorsqu'une famille est ainsi endeuillée, nous partageons tous son deuil. I wish to offer my sincere, sincere condolences to the family and friends of this individual at their time of sorrow and to remember all the other lives we have lost to the virus over the past year. With each death we experience, we are reminded of the seriousness of the pandemic. We are reminded again of the urgency of following public health guidance and advice. And we are reminded of the importance of our mission to keep New Brunswickers healthy and safe. Le secteur d'Edmundston et Grand Sault est en, le, je m'excuse, le secteur d'Edmundston est en confinement depuis maintenant 12 jours et les, prog les progrès réalisés en vue de se sortir de cette éclosion sont lents. J'ai bon espoir que nous serons bientôt en mesure de lever les restrictions imposées en période de confinement si la tendance se poursuit au cours des prochains jours. Bien que le nombre de nouveaux cas fluctue chaque jour, nous surveillons de près la moyenne de cas sur une période de sept jours. Cette moyenne nous donne une idée plus, plus précise de la tendance générale. This number is slowly going down in zone four, which is a positive sign. At the beginning of April, the rolling seven-day average of new cases in zone four was more than 10. As of yesterday, that number was five. This shows that some progress is being made. Notre objectif consiste à obtenir une moyenne de trois cas ou moins sur une période de sept jours sans connaître une diminution du nombre de tests de dépistage subis. Les données doivent aussi pr prouver que le confinement obtient les résultats visés en ce qui concerne la prévention de nouveaux cas attribuables au déplacement au sein de la population. Et euh, je peux vous montrer euh, un, un portrait de la zone 4. Uh, so this graph shows why we remain concerned about the Edmundston situation. Each dot in this image represents a confirmed case with the lines showing connections between the cases. You can see that we have three large clusters of cases where we have confirmed linkages. There are also several smaller groups and a large number of dots with no connection to any other known case. To lift the lockdown, we need to see the elimination of new cases from community transmission as well as those brought into the area through unnecessary travel. To achieve these goals, it is very important that everyone who is asked to self-isolate do so away from others in a separate dwelling so that the virus does not have the opportunity to spread. This is our best chance to succeed right now and make sure that we don't continue to put pressure on the hospital system where we have patients hospitalized and in ICU at the moment. It means that family members should not pick you up from the airport. They should not handle your dishes from delivered meals. The risk is just too high of infecting your loved ones and the individuals with whom they work and other contacts. And as you know, the variant that's um, involved right now in zone four is the UK variant, but we are seeing variants in other zones, including the South African variant. And we are very, very, very concerned about the arrival of the variant from India that has appeared in Quebec and other provinces in Canada. 
santé publique continuera à surveiller et d'évaluer l'éclosion dans la zone 4. Nous avons recommandé au cabinet que le secteur d'Edmonton demeure en confinement et que la situation soit réévaluée le lundi 26 avril. À cette date, nous réévaluerons également la situation de la région de Grand Sault Drummond qui demeure pour le moment au niveau d'alerte orange. I want to thank the people of Edmonton for their determined efforts to help us reduce the scope of this outbreak. It has been a very great collaborative effort and I'm very, very impressed with the work that is being done from that entire community. Tomorrow, I will be doing a live stream talk with Dr. John Tobin, Head of Family Medicine in Zone 4 with the Vitalité Health Network. We will be talking about the situation in Zone 4 as well as our vaccine rollout. And if you have questions for us, please submit them through the government's Facebook page. Aujourd'hui, Santé publique annonce qu'il y a 19 nouveaux cas de COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Il y a 11 nouveaux cas dans la zone 4 sur la région d'Edmonton et de Grand Sault. Ce chiffre comprend 9 cas confirmés au pavillon Beaulieu, un foyer de soins spéciaux situé à Grand Sault. Il y a trois nouveaux cas dans la zone 2 qui comprend les comtés de St. John, Kings et Charlotte et sont tous liés à des voyages à l'extérieur de la province. Il y a aussi deux nouveaux cas dans la zone 3 sur la région de Fredericton et de la vallée de la rivière Saint-Jean. L'un de ces cas est directement lié à un voyage alors que l'autre fait toujours l'objet d'une enquête. Il y a deux nouveaux cas dans la zone 1 sur la région de Moncton et du sud-est du Nouveau-Brunswick qui sont tous les deux liés à un voyage. Il y a aussi un nouveau cas dans la zone 6, soit la région de Bathurst et de la péninsule acadienne, qui est lié à un voyage. Il y a maintenant 146 cas actifs de COVID-19 dans la province. En tout, 15 personnes sont hospitalisées à l'heure actuelle, dont 5 aux soins intensifs. Today, Public Health is reporting 19 new cases of COVID-19 in the province of New Brunswick. In Zone 4, which is the Edmonston Grand Falls area, there are 11 new cases, and this includes nine confirmed cases at Pavillon Beaulieu, a special care home in Grand Falls. In the Grand Falls situation, apparently, while there are many infected, effects have been greatly reduced. The virus can still be transmitted, but this has shown that vaccination is working. Um, and by that, uh, we do know that about 40% of the population is now vaccinated in that area, which is great. It doesn't mean that the transmission won't still occur, but it does mean that those people who have been vaccinated and who do become infected will have a very, very, very low likelihood of needing to be hospitalized or admitted to ICU. There are three new cases in Zone 2, which is St. John, Kings and Charlotte counties, all of which are related to travel outside the province. There are two new cases in, in Zone 3, which is the Fredericton and St. John River Valley. One of these is directly related to travel, while the other is under investigation. There are two new cases in Zone 1, which is Moncton and Southeast New Brunswick, both related to travel. There is also one new case in Zone 6, which is Bathurst and the Acadian Peninsula, which is travel related. There are now 146 active cases of COVID-19 in the province. There are 15 individuals now in hospital, including five who are in intensive care. I ask again that you offer your thoughts and prayers for these New Brunswickers, as well as the 750 people who are self-isolating to help us slow the spread of this disease. We remain very, very concerned about outbreaks of COVID-19 in communal living locations because the speed, of which, the speed with which the virus can move in these settings. This week, our prompt teams have been activated to address new outbreaks at Pavignon Beaulieu in Grand Falls and at Murray Street Lodge in Grand Bay Westfield in Zone 2. Our teams are working with staff and residents to enhance infection control at these facilities and they will continue to support these homes for as long as necessary. And I do want to thank our teams for their diligence in helping to make these residences safe. Santé publique continuera de surveiller ces éclosions de près jusqu'à ce que deux périodes d'incubation complète se soient écoulées, soit 28 jours sans nouvelles infections. Public Health is today declaring an end to the outbreak at Residence Roland Long in Edmonston. This particular outbreak was quickly brought under control because the residents were all moved to hotel rooms where they were isolated from one another and were under 24-hour supervision. They needed to be moved because they could not self-isolate adequately within the home. The residents have now all received negative test results and have returned to the residence.
Municipal elections will be held across New Brunswick on Monday, May 10th. Like so much else in the past year, this election campaign will look and feel different from what we have experienced in the past. Public Health has provided guidelines to candidates on how they can conduct their campaign safely, and information is available on the Elections NB website. And I would like to remind everyone involved in this year's election to make themselves familiar with those rules so that everyone will remain healthy and safe. Santé publique a encouragé les candidats à utiliser d'autres moyens pour faire passer leur message, comme les médias sociaux et le dépôt des dépliants. Candidates in the areas um, in areas at the yellow and orange alert levels may choose to campaign door to door, but if you do, please follow public health guidance. Wear a mask, maintain two meters of physical distance at all times, and do not go into voters' homes. These measures will help ensure that this election is conducted without further spread of COVID-19. We are making some progress against COVID-19 in New Brunswick, but to maintain this momentum, we must continue to be on our guard, especially with the variants that we're now dealing with. Again, these are very, very different than the strains that we saw before the variants arrived. This virus does not move by itself, and if we don't move either, then neither does COVID-19. L'approche du printemps après un long hiver où ils ont dû se plier aux restrictions de santé publique, les gens veulent bouger. Je les comprends. Cependant, si nous restons près de chez nous et prenons les mesures requises pour nous protéger et protéger notre famille, nous aurons, nous aurons plus de chances de contenir la propagation du virus responsable de la COVID-19. By standing our ground for just a few more weeks, I mean, we are probably about 10 weeks away from having everybody vaccinated with their first dose in this province. We will get through this. We just need to get through the next 10 weeks. So please take care of yourselves, look after your community, and the only way that we will get through this and continue to do so is by doing it together. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Yesterday, Marsha and I were saddened to learn that another person in our province has passed away as a result of COVID-19. On behalf of all New Brunswickers, we would like to share our sincere condolences with their loved ones. Our thoughts and prayers continue to be with you during this difficult time. Pour l'instant, il est encore plus important que je m'aie de continuer à suivre les conseils de la santé publique et à respecter le rete obligatoire afin de ralentir la propagation de la COVID-19. Most residents have been doing their part and following the rules. But I have been disappointed by a few reports of people blatantly violating regulations by failing to wear a mask, participating in large gatherings, and failing to self-isolate properly when required. We are more than a year into the pandemic and there's no excuse for this behavior, especially when we are so close to the finish line. These actions are dangerous and put others at risk. While peace officers focus on education, I want to remind all New Brunswickers that violating the emergency order can have serious consequences, and this does include substantial fines. Just cette semaine, des contraventions ont été données à la suite d'un raisonnement dans la zone 4, où des participants ne respectent pas les règlements de la santé publique. Between April 9th and 15th, officers conducted 67 checks to ensure people in zone 4 who were required to self-isolate were doing so properly. They only found two cases where people were not complying. We know it only takes one case to cause an outbreak. Peace officers will continue to check on people who are self-isolating throughout the province and will follow up on all complaints that they receive about violations of the mandatory order. Il faut absolument que toute personne qui a reçu un ordre d'auto-isolement de la part de la santé publique, d'un fournisseur de soins de santé ou d'un agent de la part, suive des consignes correctement. Cela veut dire qu'il faut rester à la maison pendant 14 jours et inviter tout contact avec les autres. Si vous ne pouvez pas, invite, pas inviter les contacts avec les autres personnes de votre ménage, 
tous les membres de votre ménage doivent s'y isoler pendant quatre jours. 14 jours. While self-isolating, do not spend time in the same room with another person in the household. Do not eat together or do not share a bathroom. We have seen cases where an entire household becomes infected, sometimes with tragic results. We are currently looking at putting additional measures in place to ensure people are complying with self-isolation requirements. Peace officers are also conducting random checks in, in Zone 4 to ensure people are following the rules and will issue tickets when the rules are not being followed properly. The small number of people who are disobeying the rules right now are putting others at risk. While prolonging the amount of time, we must all wait until we can enjoy all activities safely. In recent months, we have made significant progress with our vaccine plan. As of today, more than 196,000 New Brunswickers, nearly 30% of the population aged 16 or older, have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Another 95,000 of those doses have been administered at a pharmacy. And I want to thank pharmacists across the province who have adapted quickly to help the vaccine rollout go as smoothly as possible. In fact, as Dr. Russell said, we need 10 more weeks. The current supply and predicted supply of vaccine would see us doing up to 45,000 a week through May and June. This will get us to the levels we need to have summer in New Brunswick. But let's not blow it in the process. Let's make sure that we follow the rules and we get through this next 10 weeks and we can manage through the rest. More than 40% of the people, over 16 in Zone 4, have been vaccinated so far, and we can already see the impact of that vaccine level. Bien qu'il y ait encore des cas de transmission, nous voyons beaucoup moins de cas de, la, de maladies graves dans la région de Grand Sud. Il s'agit d'une bonne nouvelle, mais nous ne n'avons pas basé la garde. While vaccinations have been offered to workers in all of the province's long-term care facilities, not everyone has chosen to get their shot. This is a real concern, as just yesterday, two new outbreaks were declared in special care homes located in Grand Falls and in Grand Bay Westfield. Staff in these facilities are doing essential work by caring for vulnerable New Brunswickers, and I want to thank them for the crucial role they have played and continue to play. I also want to encourage them to take steps to protect themselves, as well as the people they care for. To date, while around 92% of long-term care residents have received their first dose, only 59% of long-term care workers have chosen to be vaccinated. This in comparison to more than 90% of staff working in the regional health authorities have had their first dose of the vaccine. It is essential that in the coming weeks, more long-term care workers choose to get vaccinated. Truck drivers, are another crucial group that we must protect so they can continue to perform the essential role that they have performed throughout this entire pandemic. There are approximately 3,200 New Brunswick truck drivers who regularly cross borders as part of their essential service. Tout au long de la pandémie, nous avons compté sur alors qu'il est important des biens essentiels dans la province. Ils sont admissibles à la vaccination depuis le 24 mars et j'encourage tous les camionneurs à prendre un rendez-vous pour recevoir le premier dose de vaccin de que possible. Just over a week ago, 29% of New Brunswick truck drivers who regularly travel across borders had received their first dose of the vaccine. To date, 49% have had their first dose and I thank each and every one of them for taking the time to do so. I know their schedules can be unpredictable, which is why we're working closely with Atlantic Provinces Trucking Association to make vaccines as accessible as possible. Earlier this week, we created a dedicated phone line for New Brunswick tra truck drivers to contact us or we contact them directly for assistance in booking a va vaccination appointment. The number is 1-833-724-0088. And it has been shared with the Trucking Association and employers in the industry to ensure drivers are aware. 
I have also reached out, as many of you know, to the Governor of Maine to see if there's an opportunity to allow New Brunswickers who cross the border regularly for work to get vaccinated while in the state, similar to the agreement Manitoba and North Dakota announced earlier this week. Nous sommes privilégiés d'avoir accès aux vaccins que peuvent aider à nous protéger d'un virus dangereux et la potentiellement mortal. I'm optimistic that we will be able to take advantage of surplus vaccines as they become available in Maine. And where we continue to be optimistic because we both have the same, the same interests. We both want our borders open. And the sooner we are vaccinated to the same levels necessary, the sooner that will be a reality. As more groups become eligible to receive the vaccine, I hope New Brunswickers will make an informed decision and consider what they can do to keep themselves and the people around them as safe as possible. Throughout the pandemic, New Brunswickers have stepped up and done their part and continue to do so. It wasn't any surprise to me that more than 20 people with healthcare experience have answered the call we put out earlier this week to travel to Ontario to assist with their COVID-19 response. I want to thank these people for offering to help a province that has been hit so hard with the virus. You are going above and beyond, and I know the people of Ontario appreciate your willingness to help provide essential medical services at this very critical time. You indeed make New Brunswickers proud. La grande majorité de gens de New Brunswick donne un exemple positif. La plupart des gens portent des masques, évitant les raisonnements et sauto illusion de la bonne façon lorsque cela est nécessaire. Thank you for doing the right thing, even when it is difficult to do so. Do not be discouraged by isolated incidents of rule breaking and bad behavior. We will work with all individuals, as we must. We all need to speak to each other. We all need to encourage each other to just be patient, to be diligent, and just help us. Help us get through this next critical 10 weeks, even though we see outbreaks all around us. And even though we have concerns that remain and continue here in New Brunswick, we can do this. We've been exemplary so far. We can deliver at the end of the day and be proud of what we've accomplished together. We mean to remember what we've been saying since COVID-19 first appeared in our province. We are indeed in this together. We are indeed working like never before as a team. By taking care of each other and by thinking about how our actions impact our family, our friends, our neighbors, and our colleagues, we will make it through this pandemic. We will come out the other side stronger and better. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much, Premier. Dr. Russell, merci beaucoup, Monsieur Premier Ministre, Dr. Russell. We'll now proceed with questions from members of the media. Each reporter will have one question. You have the right to pose your question in the official language of your choice. Please ensure your microphones are placed on mute. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Vous avez le droit de poser votre question dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Chaque journaliste aura une question. Voulez-vous assurer de désactiver le son de vos micro? Andrew Watt, Brunswick News. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Premier, I'd like, you, I'd like to get your thoughts on the uh, international borders and the flights continuing to come in from COVID hotspots like India. Uh, what do you think the federal government should do and how would you rate their performance in controlling the international borders throughout the pandemic? Well, I think response time has been critical, and, and at this time, there's out, without any doubt in my mind that the international borders to hot zones like India should be closed. Um, these flights should not continue to come into Canada. Um, and I think, you know, we've been talking with public health and we're assessing just how we manage that if, if they do continue, because it's, um, the response time is critical. We've, we've known that here in the province, and, and uh, it's, it's been certainly a great component to the success we've had to date. And uh, that's what we need from the federal government. We need a rapid response to this situation. Thank you, Premier. Travis Portman, Global TV. Hi there. I was just wondering if you had numbers on how many new Brunswickers have volunteered to go to Ontario to help out there. At this point, it's around 20. Thank you, Mr. Portman. Laura 
Carlisle, CTV. Hi, thank you, Bruce. Uh, this question would be for Premier Higgs. Uh, Premier Higgs, can you uh, tell us what has come out of those conversations that you started um, with the governor in Maine, um, and, and what, if anything, you're hearing uh, from their side? Well, initially, so my call went out to Governor Mills, and I haven't talked, spoken to her directly. We talked to her office directly. My my staff talked to uh, talked to Governor Mills um, staff, and basically, they said that they wanted to entertain this conversation later, but right now, they they weren't in a position to do so. And you know, later is in terms of days or a week. Uh, it won't be months. But I think what we've seen with a um, major increase in our vaccine supply, um, almost doubling that. You know, we, we that's going to uh, is now projected to happen over May and June, and and I think what we've seen in the U.S. is their willingness. Uh, President Biden has certainly said that he wants to look at Canada and provide surplus doses to to Canada, and and I uh, our nearest neighbors certainly the state of Maine would be uh, would be part of that, and they gave any indication every indication that although they couldn't entertain it right now, it would be something they they certainly would uh, be willing to look at in the near future. Marie Sutherland, CBC. Hi, uh, my question is for Premier Higgs. Um, so are, are you saying then that vaccine hesitancy among long-term care workers is, is uh, partly to blame for the continuing care home outbreak? Well, I'm, not, I'm saying it's a concern. Um, and yes, we, we've had certainly um, some of the workers there that, are, that have tested positive. Now, fortunately, the residents, as, as, we, as I pointed out, and Dr. Russell's pointed out, are, are over 90% vaccinated. So the residents, uh, you know, are protected, but, but we need to be sure that the employees remain protected. And, you know, at a, at a roughly 60, 65% level of vaccination, when other healthcare workers in, in the, you know, for the, for the health authorities are at the 90 plus percentile. So I, I, we're encouraging them. Uh, we need them to protect themselves because they, they, are, they are providing a service to, to uh, a vulnerable population. And also, they, they risk you know, infecting others in the community, which is what we're watching so closely right now with the, with the variant uh, concerns. Thank you. Vicki Hobart, CHCO TV. Thank you, Bruce. Premier Higgs, I'm just wondering, how does what's happening in Nova Scotia affect the reopening of the Atlantic bubble? Has there been a new date set or talked about, and do you have concerns for New Brunswick based on what's going on just next door? Well, we have concerns for each other, and um, and we've had uh, numerous discussions, the, the other three premiers and myself, about our uh, respective conditions in, in our provinces. And so, yeah, it certainly affects the bubble, but but I, uh, we're all talking, you know, uh, mid to later part of May. Uh, so we're being very optimistic in that regard. And, and I would say that, yes, this recent outbreak, both, uh, you know, what we have been experiencing for the last uh, several weeks in New Brunswick and, and what Nova Scotia is currently experiencing is, is obviously concerning. But it's um, the vaccines, I, I continue to put our emphasis there because if, if, we're, if we receive the vaccines that are now committed and we have every reason to believe that that will indeed be the case, and, and even greater, um, our challenge will be that uh, is putting vaccines into arms, and I have every confidence because we have planned for this. We're ready to roll out vaccines as they arrive. We've demonstrated that we can do that, and our ability has just continued to ramp up, and uh, we, we feel that you know we can go much higher than 45,000 a week if, if need be. So I would say the Atlantic bubble is, is still very much a reality, but we are pushing into the latter part of May at the earliest. Derek Dubé, can you give me off? Oui, la question est pour Dr. Russell ou euh, le Premier ministre Higgs. J'aimerais savoir, vous avez mentionné en anglais que plus de 92% des personnes résidant en foyer de soins sont vaccinées, ainsi que 59%, c'est très faible, des employés. J'aimerais savoir euh, le pourcentage là, euh, de personnes qui ont eu deux doses là, dans la population vieillissante, que ce soit dans des foyers de soins ou euh, un peu partout, là, des 70 ans et plus. And Mama, do you have any questions? Alors, uh, pour l'instant, pour toutes les gens uh, dans les, uh, les résidences à long terme, uh, ils ont eu leur première dose. 
euh, on, va con, on va commencer à donner les, les deuxièmes doses euh, euh, dans les résidences euh, sous peu. Merci, M. Dupé. Kathleen Jones, en New Brunswick.com. Hi, uh, this question is supposed to be in your case. I'm wondering, now that 40% of the population is in Edmonton, is there any reason why you have been vaccinated? Uh, when will vaccination be redistributed more evenly across the province? Well, I would suggest the focus, and from our discussion this morning with public health and and, uh, and the COVID cabinet committee and cabinet, um, the the recommendation is that the, the emphasis will continue to be placed in a red zone, a lockdown zone, uh, orange zones, any in the, the, the degree of severity. So this is locked down. Um, so it'll continue to get um, you know a priority. Uh, we've come up in the last week. Um, you know, we've come up probably five percent throughout the province. And um, so we're still rising that percentage throughout the province, but but I would say the focus will continue to be to get the Edmonton region under control. And as long as it's in red, uh, it needs to be a priority region. Or sorry, sorry as long as it's locked down. Thank you. Michel Cordivo, Radio Canada. <coughs> Michel? Alexandre Boudreau, l'Acadie Nouvelle. Bonjour, ma question serait pour le Premier ministre Higgs. Um, je ne sais pas s'il si peut entendre la traduction. Oui. Oui? Oui, OK. Euh, donc, oh, je pense que vous avez mentionné tantôt de nouvelles mesures pour s'assurer que les gens respectent le confinement. Um, Est-ce que vous pouvez élaborer? C'est quoi ces, ces nouvelles mesures-là? De quoi il s'agit? No, not new measures as such, but a, but a, a certainly an, an enforcement of the current measures. Um, we we just have to be diligent in every region, and particularly in in the uh, in the area of Emmiston and and being a lockdown. But but you know we're seeing cases that um, you know are appearing elsewhere. So uh, we're we're going to be just a little more diligent throughout the province, and and we have to have people respect that that it's it's necessary. And, and at this point in time, when we're all COVID weary and, and you know, we just like to be doing something else, um, we've got to just hang tough for the, for the next 10 weeks. And with vaccines, the way they're planned to be provided to our province, it's really exciting to be at this level. Because if you think about a year ago or more, um, yeah, more than a year ago, a, a vaccine certainly uh, when we just got into this, but we're, we're not even a reality. So we're so close. We just got to get tighter following the rules. We got to get tighter ensuring that people follow the rules. And that, that's the program. Thank you. Michel Oui, pardon, le téléphone a suivi un problème. C'est une question pour Dr. Russell. J'aimerais savoir s'il y a des mesures possibles pour encourager davantage de gens dans la région de Montana à avoir le vaccin, peut-être en réduisant l'âge, quelque chose comme ça, parce qu'il semble y avoir beaucoup de places disponibles encore, entre autres, pour la clinique de samedi. À ce moment-ci, on va continuer à offrir les, les vaccins à, 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 à les gens qui, qui, qui sont dans les, les, les ranges d'âge pour notre but pour ce moment-ci. Mais certainement, on va continuer à, à mettre la priorité sur le, le zone 4 à ce moment-ci. Merci, M. Brunswick News. Hi there. I'd like to hear from Premier Higgs on this question. Um, data from the health department shows that there hasn't yet been a single case of transmission of COVID-19 from a temporary foreign worker or an international university student to uh, the province's general population. And in my mind, this has to be because of the strict isolation requirements that require two weeks uh, to be spent in a hotel or a dorm room. And kind of away from the settings that you mentioned in your address, like can lead to the tragedies like the one you mentioned with the, the family in a home setting. Um, we have seen instances of the COVID-19 being passed along by non-essential travelers. And so I wonder what prevents your government from implementing stricter isolation requirements, perhaps something like a mandatory hotel stay for people who enter this province for non-essential reasons. And I wonder if the calculation is changing as we confront you know, faster spreading, more dangerous, more costly viruses to our healthcare system. Thank you. Bye. Well, I think the, the question is certainly valid in relation to what new measures may be required to, to ensure isolation and enforce isolation. 
and and giving the um, the time of the year with you know many uh, let's say uh, snowbirds wanting to return back to the province, um, and certainly the movement of students as well. Uh, we uh, this is this is under very active consideration now in consultation with public health, and and what what uh, additional measures or tightening may be required. So um, that this is not lost, uh, Tom, and this is something that um, you know we're meeting now daily. Uh, we had a meeting today. We'll we'll continue to meet, and uh, but but it uh, it may become a reality, um, just exactly what we're referring to. Thank you, Mr. Bateman. Danielle Lee bringing CBC. Thank you, Premier Higgs. Uh, how are we having so many separate travel-related outbreaks in different parts of the province? Is it only because people are not understanding the self-isolation requirements, or is there something else happening here? Well, Dr. Russell may want to comment on this one as well, and, and I would say it's a combination of the above. Um, when we talk about just greater enforcement, and not, not, it's, it's not all about just additional enforcement in, in relation to new rules, it's about following the rules we have. And, uh, and yes, we have seen cases where, you know, you, you'd say, well, if you try come in by aircraft, have a, have a car there to take you somewhere, um, and then you drive it, you isolate, have someone that delivers your groceries and all this. And, you know, there's certainly evidence that that doesn't happen. Someone, you know, you pick somebody up and, and they go. So they're negative at the time, but then they become positive and then we get in trouble. Or they go home with a family and say, well, I'm going to isolate with my family. And then the family becomes infected. So it's, it's really... I think, you know, we're at the balancing point right now, or the tipping point, we might say, is that how do we get, get the next 10 weeks in? And, and so rather than someone say, oh, I'm, I'm fine, you know, I don't need to worry about this because I, I didn't have a problem, just assume you have a problem. And, and just, just act accordingly, and let's just hang in there for the, for the next 10 weeks so that we can get over this hump and, uh, and get back to a, a summer in New Brunswick. Like, uh, it might be different, but it'll be a whole lot better. Yeah. And I will just add to that. Um, so let's say seven months ago, we, we've had great compliance throughout the entire pandemic, I have to say. So let's say we have been maintaining that compliance at roughly, for example, again, I'm, it's not the exact number, but let's say it's about 97%. Well, seven months ago, if we had 97% compliance, we were doing excellent because one, there were no variants of concern. Number two, the case counts all around the rest of Canada and the rest of the world were not so bad. Um, and we didn't have people partially vaccinated who who would t perhaps um, think that they were protected when actually they're not in the sense that they could still transmit to people who've been vaccinated. So seven months later, we might still have the same amount of compliance where there's maybe 97% compliance, but that 3% margin of error in terms of people who may not be compliant through no fault of their own or deliberately either or situation, um, we just don't have a margin of error or a cushion now because the variants are so much more aggressive and so much more contagious and so the risks are much higher from that regard but the number of cases across this country and across the globe have skyrocketed uh, and not only are they higher in numbers but it's the variants and the variants of concern are are you know the uk brazil south african and now the indian variant i mean these are very very challenging uh variants to deal with and so we're just in a totally different uh, part of the uh, of the pandemic now and having our population partially vaccinated does protect those vulnerable populations from having severe outcomes like hospitalization and ICU admission and death but there's a whole whole large swath of our population who have not been vaccinated yet and we have to maintain our high levels of, of compliance until we can get everybody vaccinated but if we could increase those levels of compliance even further that would be great because we're already seeing that doing everything right at this moment is still having impacts in terms of uh, our impacts on healthcare system right now thank you savannah thank you. Uh, telegraph journal Hi, uh, my question is for the Premier. Um, when do you plan on allowing property owners and family to residents into the province with a 14-day isolation? And does that answer change if those family members or property owners, uh, if they have been fully vaccinated? So right now, we are looking across the board to come up with a plan for the, the spring and the summer in relation to people returning to New Brunswick. We, I, I don't have, we haven't confirmed any date when we would look at property owners coming from out of province or out of country back to their location. Um, I can only say that 
you know, given the, the where we need to be and, and with our, uh, our certainly level of vaccinations, we need to be in the 75% level. And until we're there, it's going to be uh, probably unlikely that we're going to allow property owners to come back to visit um, until we've achieved that and they are, they are also vaccinated. But there, isn't, uh, there hasn't been a date set. It'll all be dependent on our ability to vaccinate and what we see happening around us. Thank you. Harry Forstel, CBC. Thank you, Bruce. Um, either the Premier or Dr. Russell. Uh, my question is this. You pointed out, Premier, only 59% of LTC workers have chosen to be vaccinated. Very particular choice of words. Versus 90% of RHA staff. Why is that number of LTC workers so low? And what do you uh, intend to do about it? Or what can be done about it? Well, at this point, Harry, we're certainly looking at that and contacting each facility, contacting uh, the plan to contact each in individual worker and encourage them to be vaccinated. As you know, uh, we do not have a mandatory vaccination policy but we certainly are assisting anyone that we can in relation to number one, be vaccinated where they are um, exposed themselves or exposing to uh, a vulnerable population, uh, essential workers, and then certainly encouraging the general pop public to be vaccinated. So, but in this situation, we're, we've ramped it up with direct contact um, and asking, you know, what more do we need? I mean, when you see the level of healthcare workers, to your point, and what I referenced earlier, a, a 90 plus percent, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to understand why uh, another section of the healthcare profession uh, and, and public service profession in, in long-term care would, would, not be, um, would not be part of that, or they'd have kind of the same understanding. So we're, we're encouraging not only we will contact, but our health professionals to contact and the in the in these these facilities are private facilities uh we just need to make this happen and that's our effort this week to uh, see that change dramatically thank you david coach brunswick news uh yes um for premier higgs um a new report from the human development council indicates that a living wage allowing households in london to cover basic expenses and also live with dignity and a decent quality of life would be eighteen dollars and thirty-five cents um, per hour, or six six dollars and sixty cents higher than the minimum wage. The group says the province needs to shrink the gap um, in New Brunswick between the living wage and the eleven dollars seventy-five cent minimum wage, which, as you know, is tied to inflation. Um, do you see low wages as a problem in New Brunswick, and do you intend to increase the minimum wage? Well, there's a study being done this year. I think is a, it's a year coming to to do a review of the minimum wage and to look at those gaps. I mean, we went on a program um, a few years ago to to connect minimum wage with the cost of living, but obviously, you know, that's that. So what I what I mean by that in relation to what we have seen in the past few years, that's been pretty low. But in relation to what we likely will see uh, for inflationary, we've certainly seen it in some aspects of the economy, and what we're likely to see going forward, there will be some self-correction right there but there there is a study being conducted in this next year and uh, we'll understand uh, the ramifications and the gap and what needs to be done about it based on the recommendations <coughs> that come out of that thank you erica butler chma doc quattro cbc Hi, good afternoon. Sorry to be uh, off topic, but this was the only way to uh, get a comment today. Uh, Premier, can you tell me about your meeting with the Chief of Habano First Nation and his? what do you make of his comment to me that tax sharing might be part of a possible agreement with the province? Well, firstly, I, uh, I was very pleased to have the opportunity to, to meet with, um, with the Chief and, and um, and I, uh, I, I certainly we discussed we discussed many uh, issues, um, which you know I, I won't go through here in in in, uh, in public. But I am I'm encouraged by certainly the level of interest that the chief has, not only for his community, but in the reality that the province is facing. And uh, and what I've said to the chief, what I've said to any of them, you know, we're we're looking at a, a sustainable path forward, and right now we don't have one. And, and there are a lot of factors that can contribute to a sustainable path forward and, a, and, a, and a, I guess an improvement 
in, in the lives of certainly First Nations uh, communities and in, in their members and, and in, in, in the, the hope and future and, and, and being together as we, as we improve uh, our conditions here in all of New Brunswick. So what I would say is there was tremendous alignment in our discussion, and, um, and I'm excited about the, the future potential of, of real discussion on real issues, and certainly that's what I saw evident with, uh, with Chief Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Poitra. Marlo Blass, Telegraph Journal. Thanks, Bruce. My question is for Dr. Russell. There was a COVID-19 exposure at St. Matthew's Church in St. John on April 18th. How many people are being asked to isolate following this exposure, and is this case a variant of concern? I don't have the exact number of people who have been contacted by public health. That's done by the public health regional staff in uh, Zone 2. So the public health nurses would be doing that contact tracing. and. Um, and we are presuming, uh, with respect to variants of concern, we're presuming that all new cases are variants of concern, whether it's South Africa, Brazil, UK, and even now India. Thank you. Erica Butler, are you there? Not before we close, uh, Dr. Russell would like to cycle back to one question. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure who asked it, um, but they, the question was how many of the um, folks in long-term care facilities have received their second dose? And about 94% of long-term care facility residents received their first dose, um, and we now have about 25% that received their second dose. And then about 47% of long-term care facility staff have received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, and 12% have received their second dose. Um, and then when you compare that to healthcare professionals, including physicians, nurses, paramedics, extramural care, health authority staff, and other regulated allied healthcare workers, they're estimated to be um, vaccinated about 84%, with about 29% having now received a second dose. That concludes today's COVID-19 update for New Brunswick with Dr. Russell and Premier Higgs. Just for a quick recap, there were 19 new cases of COVID-19 in the province today. 11 of those were in Zone 4. I will post the rest of the breakdown um, as soon as I receive it from the province on our Facebook page. So look for it there. Um, and again, one thing we did hear from Premier Higgs today is that the Atlantic bubble, for many of you who asked, will be delayed even further till the end of May at the earliest. But once we have those dates, I will post them on Facebook as well and, and also review them in a news recap. I'm Vicki Hogarth from the CHCO News Desk. I look forward to joining you next time. A news and public affairs production of CHCO-TV, New Brunswick's only source for independent community television.